In fact, when people take the excuse me, when people take the time to interact with one another, uh, it doesn't take long to realize that for the most part, we all want the same things out of life: a uh, job with a decent wage, a safe environment for our children, and to live in a community that doesn't chastise us for our beliefs. However, in every religion, uh, in every population, you'll find a small group of people who hold so fervently to their beliefs that they feel they must use any means necessary to make others live as they do. Being raised in the home of a Muslim zealot, I have been exposed to many of the things that Americans fear about Islam, yet I stand here promoting peace. This would be impossible in a world where we hang on to those old prejudices. I'm here to dispel some of the stereotypes that certain politicians and media pundits attempt to project into mainstream society. I feel that I can use these examples to combat those who would take advantage of Americans' fears for their own ends. Because of the political opportunists who use the more radical elements of Islam to generalize the beliefs of all Muslims, but also because of men like Faisal Shahzad, for instance, who believes that the answer to American foreign policy is trying to detonate a car bomb in Times Square, I feel I can speak up to balance the scales. Now, it's a foolish mistake to believe that religious extremism is exclusive to Islam. Unfortunately, there are endless examples in every belief system of religiously motivated violence. But as a society that values the individual freedoms afforded to us, it's un-American to ostracize entire communities for the actions of a few. When we ostracize the innocent, it tears apart the fabric of our society, which in turn helps to cre create, or foment rather, the next generation of intolerance. Uh, it may come as a surprise to some of you that although I was raised in the religion of Islam, uh, I'm no longer a Muslim. Uh, that has little to do with my feelings on the religion itself, but rather uh, my uncertainty of an American being. But, um, I only mention this to uh, specify that I'm not uh, here promoting one specific uh, lifestyle or ideology. I'm just here to share my stories and the lessons that I learned from that. Now having said that, I would like to illustrate the path that I was put on as a child by my father who for most of my life has resided in maximum security prisons. This was a special Friday for me. I was a normal six-year-old, staring at the chalkboard, waiting for the three o'clock bell to ring so that I could escape from school. But that day, my father was waiting in the hallway early. He said, Salaam Alaikum, which means, peace be upon you. And I replied, Wa Alaikum Salaam, and peace be upon you, the proper way for two Muslims to greet one another. He tells me that we're going to the mosque for Friday prayer where the blind Sheikh Omar Abdurrahman was to preach. You see, at midday every Friday, millions of Muslims around the world gather into mosques to listen to sermons given by Sheikhs. The Quran, the sacred text of Islam, says that praying in a group brings you more blessings than praying alone, making Friday prayer the most blessed prayer of the week. Most clerics preach harmony between Muslims and non-Muslims believing that there is a place in this world for all of its inhabitants to live in their existence. The blind sheikh was not one of those men. He sat at the front of the worshippers with a microphone attached to his collar, and I sat there trying my best to mimic my father as he listened intently to the sheikh's words. That day, the sheikh argued that Western culture was corrupting Muslims all over the planet, that the consequences of Western democracy were materialism, sexual perversion and idolatry meant to distract the believers from the true word of God, laying the blame for the Muslim world's ills on many of the same groups that Jerry Falwell blamed for 9-11, uh, pagans, feminists, and gays. But the, but the sheikh saved his most venomous words for those of the Jewish faith. He spoke of interference and collusion by the United States and its Western allies to further their agenda at the expense of Muslim nations, and he used America's support to foment the emotions of his congregation. He also claimed that the United States had persevered in its Cold War with the Soviet Union by using the hearts and bodies of Muslims as a military and economic stream, and that once the Soviet fell, uh, as, and that once the Soviets fell. America discarded those Afghan fighters like trash on the road. 
Excuse me. Um, after he was finished with his sermon, my uh, father led, took my hand and led me toward the front. This wasn't the first time that I'd met the Sheikh. In fact, I'd spent more than a few nights either at the mosque or at one of my father's friends' houses or even in our own living room, sitting on the floor, listening to the Sheikh and the other men discuss religion and politics. I realized it was always somewhat ominous exchanging words with the Sheikh after one of his sermons. And it's looking back now that I realize even in a room full of people vying for his attention, his mind was somewhere else. Probably still wrapped with the passion and anger that he clearly conveyed in his speech. On the drive home that afternoon, uh, I wondered to myself what made the Sheikh and his followers so devout. I asked my father, when did you become such a good Muslim? And he replied, when I came to this country and saw everything that was wrong with it. And in that instant, I saw the same look on his face that I had seen earlier on the Sheikh's. Uh, our family dynamic began to change soon after. It was during that time, at the height of the Afghan war, that I was forced to say goodbye to one of my best friends. Uh, his stepfather took him and his siblings from their home in New Jersey to Pakistan to train and then eventually fight in Afghanistan. Uh, he was 10 years old at the time. Because of his inexperience, he was used to lob grenades at the enemy's occupying forces. And when he'd returned to America less than a year later, where once there stood a happy, vibrant child, now stood a solemn veteran of the Afghan war. He was a shadow of his former self. His innocence taken from him by a war he had no business being a part of. This is what happens when we use violence as a resolution of conflict. In a back and forth effort to gain even the slightest strategic advantage against one's enemies, man has gone to lengths that seem inconceivable to those who are sheltered from the negative effects of war. But make no mistake, humanity has shown that it's willing to exploit almost any resource, even the lives of children, all in the name of one ideology or another. Each time we resort to war, whether as a means of resolving conflict, or for spreading some ill-conceived idea of freedom, we guarantee an escalation and desensitization of violence in our culture. The summer after I turned seven, my grandfather came to visit our family from Egypt. Little did he know, my father had brought him here to try and convince him to take my family back to Egypt so that my father could go fight in the Afghan war. You see, at the time, the United States was secretly funding the Mujahideen, the Muslim men and sometimes children, who were going to uh, Afghanistan to fight from all over the world. My grandfather's response was, absolutely not. Your family is your responsibility. If you want to make jihad, stay here and take care of them. Now, let's take that word jihad, for example. If you were to ask the average person, what do you think jihad means? They might say that it's an act of terrorism, or that it means holy war. But that is not the definition of jihad. In reality, jihad can be something as simple as providing for your family. And in fact, uh, in Islam, the Prophet Muhammad specifically refers to jihad that <coughs> precludes violence as the greater jihad. It has a much more subtle meaning, and it was with that lesson that I was taught as a child that jihad can simply mean striving to live a moral and virtuous life. My grandfather went back home thinking that he'd won the argument, but my father was left only frustrated and unwilling to find a non-violent outlet for those frustrations. On November 5th, 1990, when I was seven years old, my father assassinated a man. That man was Rabbi Meir Kahana, the leader of the Jewish Defense League. The JDL, as it was called, was described by the federal government as the largest terrorist organization operating inside the United States at the time. And while attempting to flee the scene, my father was also shot by a federal postal officer. Uh, both he and Meir Kahana were rushed to the hospital with similar gunshot wounds to the neck. Kahana died at Bellevue Hospital that night. My father lived. Although initially acquitted of the murder, while serving time on assault and weapons charges, he began planning attacks on a dozen New York City landmarks, including
including tunnels, synagogues, and United Nations headquarters. Thankfully, those plans were foiled by an FBI informant. Sadly, the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center was not. My father, al Said Nasser, would eventually be convicted for his involvement in the plot. Uh, a few months prior to his arrest, he sat me down and explained that for the past few weekends, he and some friends had been going to a shooting range for target practice. And he explained that I'd be going with him the next morning, and to be honest, I was so excited I could barely sleep that night. Uh, and my excitement once again began to mount the next morning when we got into the car. Uh, we arrived at Calverton Shooting Range, which, unbeknownst to our group, was being surveilled by the FBI. And we walked together towards uh, the trunk of a car, and inside were a range of weapons. On, when it was my turn, uh, my father helped me hold the rifle to my shoulder and explained how to aim at the target about 30 yards off. I was so nervous, my palms were sweating. Uh, I gently squeezed the trigger, and my ears rang, and the noise echoed through the woods that surrounded the range and a small knot showed where the bullet had broken through the canvas. Hearing the praise from the men around me, and with my father looking over my shoulder, smiling, it was one of my proudest moments. He seemed to be having almost as much fun as I was, if not more. Using a fully automatic weapon, he shot the legs out from under one of the larger targets, causing it to come crashing to the ground. And the men all shouted and had a laugh. But by late morning, it began to drizzle, and I knew our time at the range was probably coming to an end, so on my last turn, I took aim at the target and let each bullet fly. The last one hit the small orange light that sat on top of the target, and to everyone's surprise, especially mine, uh, the entire target burst into flames. And as I stood there watching the black smoke mix into the gray sky, my uncle turned to the other men and in Arabic said, Ibn Abu, like father, like son. They all seemed to get a really big laugh out of that comment, but it wasn't until a few years later that I fully understood what they thought was so funny. They thought they saw in me the same destruction my father was capable of. 